a freelance photographer, Pedro Polakoff, took these photos. He arrived at the scene 10 minutes after the shooting. He listened on his police scanner. He was a freelance press photographer. And he took photos before the police photographers took the photos. The photo shows Officer James Forbes holding two guns in his bare hand. Um, Forbes, uh, he testified at Mumia's trial that he held Faulkner's gun and Mumia's gun in his hand, which is suspect. I think if Mumia had a better lawyer, that would have been challenged at the time. But um, what this shows is he said that he didn't touch the metal parts because that supposedly is high preserved evidence. But rubbing them together like that goes way beyond you know, just this issue of the metal parts, okay? So here's, here he's doing this. In my opinion, speculating, I think they knew Mumia hadn't fired his gun. And that's why they didn't care about the ballistics evidence and they, they held them together, okay? But regardless of what my speculation is, we know he lied in court about purging himself in court, lying about preserving the evidence, and you know, this looks bad. Also, Officer Faulkner's hat started off on the roof of Billy Cook's car. Billy Cook is Mumia's brother who had been pulled over by Daniel Faulkner before the interaction. And the hat is moved from the top to the ground. Who knows exactly why, but they did it. And it's proven because you have the negatives, you know, in order. And in the beginning, the hat is on the top, and towards the end, the hat's on the bottom. And of course, that's where it was when the police took the official photos. If you look at the official photos, they have pictures of the hat there, which really gives this emotional effect of like the fallen officer. Maureen Faulkner was on National Public Radio and this was at a time right after this Today Show campaign we had back in 2007 and uh, the host of the NPR show quoted me and asked Maureen Faulkner, said, hey, what about this hat? And she said, oh, well, how do you know where it started and where it ended? Which was an absurd argument because it shows clearly that the, it, you know, it started at the top and ended on the bottom. And she also conceded that the photo of Forbes holding the two guns showed that the evidence was, to some extent, tampered, uh, tampered with. So a big, another big thing here is Robert Chober. He was an important prosecution witness who claimed to have been parked directly behind Officer Faulkner's car and when he witnessed the shooting. But the photos show his car was not there. And it's, unde it's undeniable. And you note, too, the other police crime scene photos, official ones, show this car is not there either. There are lots of other holes with Chobert, and I go into it in the pamphlet, but for the sake of this, I'm not going to go into that too much. Now, you have another observation. On the ground, it shows the ground, the cement, where Officer Faulkner was found. Okay, The prosecution scenario was that Mumia, after shooting Faulkner in the back, stood over Faulkner and shot down three or four times, but only hit him once. If you shoot down at this close of a range, it's going to make marks in the pavement. It's going to shoot out holes in the cement. There's going to be busted chunks of pavement in the picture. It is flat. It is clean. It shows the prosecution scenario was a total fraud. And when the prosecution's witnesses testified to that, it shows that they were coached and they were lying because they were saying what the police wanted them to say. Now, Dave Lindorf is another author who wrote a book in 2003 on Mumia. He sent one of Polakoff's photos to a NASA scientist who does uh, photo enhancement for NASA of their satellite footage, trying to look at planets so far away, seeing if they have little pockets of air or whatever it is they're looking for. But they use the top-notch photo enhancement technology that exists in the world. And he uses photo enhancement technology to look at the photos. And he concluded that there were no marks in the cement. It was not there. It's flat cement. Okay, so this is huge. Now, this is all evidence of a police frame-up, not necessarily Mumia's innocence. The last part of this story is evidence of innocence. Okay? Of course, they usually frame people up because they're innocent, but in a literal sense, Pedro Polakoff told Michael Shipman for his book that he asked police officers and they told them themselves, and he overheard them talking to each other on the scene. And they were saying that based on the testimony of two to three witnesses who mysteriously never showed up in later police reports, these police were saying 
that the shooter of Officer Faulkner had actually been the passenger in Billy Cook's car. Okay? And we know that Mumia was parked across the street because he was working as a taxi driver that night and he approached from across the street. So there's no question that Mumia was not the passenger in the car. And this is, this is big. And this leads to, so, oh yeah, <laughs> how can I forget this? The reason this is withheld evidence is because the photographer, Pedro Polakoff, went to the district attorney's office, he says he did, in 1981, 1982, at the time of the trial and the shooting, and later in 1995, when there was a PCRA hearing. He went to them, or he, he called them up several times, and said, I have these photos, I wanna give them to you to use in your case. They stonewalled him, they ignored him, they never got back to him. Because of that, Mumia's team never heard about the photos. Because the photographer was anti-Mumia, he assumed Mumia was guilty, and he didn't want to help the defense, so he didn't care about them. He just went to the prosecution. And so by the prosecution not informing the defense that these photos existed, that's misconduct. What, technically what's called a Brady violation, when a prosecutor withholds evidence that could be helpful to a defendant. Okay, so remembering this idea that the actual shooter was the passenger in the car, we'll go to another piece of evidence. There was a driver's license application in Officer Faulkner's shirt pocket. You know, you go to apply for your driver's license and they give you a sheet of paper that says, use this for a month or two until your license comes in the mail. There was this application in his front pocket and the prosecutor did not disclose that. He did not tell them that it was in the front pocket. They knew it was there, but they thought it was a bunch of papers in the back of Billy Cook's car. There was no way of knowing, because the important thing was it was in Faulkner's shirt pocket, that he had gotten it from the passenger of the car and put it in his pocket. The name of the person on the, the driver's license application was Arnold Howard, who was a friend of Billy Cook and Mumia. He, um, and this came out 13 years later, and Arnold Howard testified at the 1995 PCRA hearing before Judge Sabo, of course, who was the original judge. And Judge Sabo re ruled later that nothing that Howard said was important, along with everything else that was presented there, which is what Judge Sabo said. But Arnold Howard testified and with withstood cross-examination saying this, that he had loaned it to Kenneth Freeman. Okay? Kenneth Freeman was um, Billy Cook's best friend and business partner. They brought Howard to the police station the morning of the shooting, but he had an alibi. He had a receipt from a convenience store across town from um, about the same time as the shooting, so he could not have been there at the time, and he got sent home. Kenneth Freeman is who authors J. Patrick O'Connor and Michael Schiffman both point to as the actual shooter in both of their two books. These are the most recent books written about Mumia's case. And I find their arguments very convincing personally. That's my personal opinion. I encourage everybody to read about this themselves. Okay. But um, among other things, Billy Cook has said in his affidavit that Kenneth Freeman was there with him that night and that Freeman confessed to him to shooting Faulkner. Um, Kenneth Freeman's attorney named Daniel Alva has said for said in Dave Lindorf's book in an interview with Dave Lindorf that Billy Cook confessed to him that Freeman was with him that morning. So where's Ken Freeman today? Everybody has heard of the May 13th, 1985 bombing of the MOVE organization? Okay. Well, the morning after that, Kenneth Freeman was found in a parking lot with his hands tied behind his back with a drug needle in his arm, stripped naked and dead. Okay, so that night, May 13th, the Philly cops went after their enemies, you know. They killed the person who they believed was the true shooter of Officer Faulkner, and they continued the railroad of Mumia. And the, the time of his death is, is so striking, okay. And there's, um, there's a lot more to this, but what the scenario put out by O'Connor and by um, Michael Schiffman is that Mumia approached the scene and he was shot first by Faulkner because he saw his brother beaten blood, bloody by, by Faulkner. The bullet goes into Mumia in a downward trajectory, not an upward trajectory, if 
it was like the prosecution claim, which was that Faulkner shot up at Mumia when he was standing over him, right? Which goes back to this fraudulent scenario that the missing divots just proves also. So Mumia was shot first, and Kenneth Freeman was on the curb behind Officer Faulkner. Faulkner was looking away from the curb towards Mumia coming, and Freeman was behind him. And in response to him beating up his friend, in response to him shooting Mumia, Freeman shot Faulkner in the back. They may have scuffled, it's a little unclear what happened then, but then Faulkner was shot in the head, and Freeman went up an alley that was about, I've been on the street there about 20 feet up from the shooting, 20, 30 feet up from the shooting, there's an alley you can escape from. This is a scenario presented in those books. I find it convincing. There's a lot more in this, this pamphlet. 